This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Nick Bodmer. I'm Griffin Hammond, and I just got a potentially exciting travel opportunity that I want to run past Nick, see if he thinks I should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. I really... Sounds like fun. I always require your sign-off, Nick, to uh, to go anywhere. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I should be involved uh, in all your life's decisions. Yeah. Um, so that's good. You, you haven't been traveling quite as much as uh, you used to, so... Right. Uh, how does that sound to you before we get into the details? Like, do you miss kind of being out in the world, or has it been nice to be home, or both? What do you think? I, I would like to be out in the world. I've, I, I mean, I, I was doing a lot of traveling earlier this year to New York, but uh, I mean, I was just back and forth to New York. That's an easy trip. I haven't done any international travel. I think, let me see, it looks like it was September 2019. So yeah, pre-pandemic was the last time I did any international and what, travel. And what was that in September 2019? Where did you go? I had a project for a client that required going to Spain and France. Uh, nice. And, okay. That's fun. And that had been like, at one point I had like a list, I had like a number of like how many countries I'd been to, like in a pretty short period, it'd been like a year and a half. And I think I went to like 15 countries or something. I mean, pretty much it looks like since 2017, I was in Bahrain, Israel, Spain, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, Kazakhstan, Switzerland, Italy, Australia, Canada, Dominican Republic, UAE, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Spain, France <laughs> for work. In okay, like a two, two year things. span. One, Kazakhstan is where you had Bish Barmak. Am I remembering? Yes. Am I saying that right? That, yeah. I don't know why that sticks in my brain. I remember we talked about <laughs> it years ago on the podcast. Um, so that's interesting. And was Dominican Republic the trip we took together? Yes, that was the trip we took together. Yeah. Ah, so I did a little of your international travel with you. Yeah. And so I guess like that's fun. that. I, it's fun to like run through that list because it reminds me that this is how I've like, it's been part of my identity for many years to like say that I'm this sure. like world traveling <laughs> filmmaker and, uh, and teaching classes and doing all sorts of different things. Some of those things were State Department related, some were Panasonic related, some were client related. Um, sure. And the la latest opportunity is from the State Department that I'm, I've just been invited to. And uh, and do we know where? Is that a secret? Can we talk about it? Yeah. So I haven't even agreed to this yet. Um, so I won't share too many details of what they want. But uh, so I'm part of this program called the American Film Showcase, where they send filmmakers around the world to teach in different regions where we have diplomatic goals, like the United States government wants to, you know, like be, you know, do some goodwill. Build better in, ties. Yeah. With the, yeah. And, uh, and so they've sent me to Bahrain and uh, Palestine and Israel and uh, the UAE, Kazakhstan. And they, they've also sent me several opportunities that I've turned down. There are places I don't want to go. Like, I don't really want to go to Saudi Arabia. Um, but they've, they've just invited me just yesterday, day before recording this, they've asked me if I want to go to Zimbabwe to teach some filmmaking and specifically filmmaking around elections. They have a presidential election oh, coming up next okay. year, and they're wondering if I can do some workshops. And it's like, this sounds like exactly what I love to do. Like, let's talk about <laughs> the, the kind of work well, I've done yeah, in the U.S. Yeah, you've, I mean, your your experience at Bloomberg Politics obviously makes that uh, right up your wheelhouse. I am, you know, I'm Googling, I'm using Google Earth, where is Zimbabwe? Like, I knew it was in Africa. Right. And it looks like it's Southern Africa. Is that right? What yeah, do you know and about kind of Zimbabwe? off to the, uh, a little, a uh, little bit to the, to the east side of the southern side yeah. of the continent. Um, and the first thing I always check when I'm invited somewhere, is I always go to travel.state.gov, which is our, the U.S. Okay. State Department has like travel guidance for countries all over the world. And if you plug in Zimbabwe, it says their current travel advisory, which actually it looks like they updated as of October 7th. It says Zimbabwe level two exercise increased caution. It's yellow. And that sounds scary. You're like, oh it no, does. why? Why shouldn't I go there? And it says like, exercise increased caution in Zimbabwe due to crime. And it says, it explains that like, uh, you know, pickpocketing is, is, is common and, and things like that. Um, but I always have to remind myself, uh, with the, with the state department's website that there's like half the world is a, is a level two exercise increased caution. <laughs> 
like I, I mentioned that France and Spain were the last two countries I went to. They are level two exercise to oh, increase okay. caution. Uh, it's almost so like the levels are one normal precautions, two increased caution, three reconsider travel, and four do not travel. Right, and I think like do not travel right now is like Russia, possibly Ukraine. I mean, there's a lot of countries the United States says, like, don't go. And and some in some cases, you might even think they're being, you know, overly cautious. Like, I mean, some of it may be also political. Like, we have there are countries where the United States government does not have a good relationship with. Um, and for that reason, uh, citizens may not want to travel there. But uh, I think Saudi Arabia, for example, where I don't want to travel to, that is a reconsidered travel, a level three uh, place, ah. according to... Um, our government but I imagine the guidance would be different for everyone for every country you know if you're an Australian you may get completely different guidance from your government about where it is safe or not safe to travel to Uh, North Korea do not travel for the record if you were if you were interested or concerned so yeah I I mean I'm leaning towards yes I I think like you know I need to be vigilant and be safe uh, but uh but it sounds like it would be a rewarding experience to meet people there and learn a little bit about their political system and the their upcoming election and how I can help like enable people to capture it uh, in a way that's informative and, and useful and share some value. Yeah. And I, would you be use, working with youth again like you have in the past, I assume? Yeah, I think it would be I think it would mostly be people younger than me. Yeah. Um, probably That's awesome. like college aged. Um, so I guess also, even though I haven't agreed to it yet, um, I suppose I'll just put it out there for anyone in our audience. If you're in Zimbabwe or, or close enough to travel to the urban centers there, uh, let me know. I'd, I'd like to, to know if you have any interest in attending something like this. Hey, indie filmmakers meet up in Zimbabwe. Yeah, I think this would be, uh, we don't have dates yet, but it'll be like the beginning of next year. First couple months. Okay. Of, of, of 2023 somewhere in there i think i think it'd be an amazing opportunity sounds great and i assume the state department kind of takes care of you and makes sure you don't get like whisked away or something yeah i mean one thing i like about working with the state department is that they often do a great job of the itinerary they like pack it which is, is nice i like that they i feel efficient it'll be like a lot of the trips i've gone to making good it, use of the trip yeah, it's like we're going to visit three schools in one day and we just like we're going boom, boom, boom. And we, we're hitting all these different locations and doing all these different events. Uh, so they'll keep me busy and, uh, and and be with me the whole time. And then um, the the only thing I'm concerned about, and I, I mean, they'll they'll handle this to some extent, but uh, it's also up to my personal preference on like how I get there airplane wise. And, you know, I'm a Delta I have Delta status. And so the first thing I checked was just like, what is the Delta way to get there? You know, they, do they have partner airlines? And so I just plugged it into the Delta website and it was like 37 hours or 38 hours. And it was like Jeez. O'Hare, Chicago to Amsterdam to, I feel like it made like two or three more stops in Africa. It was like a five stop itinerary and it took forever. And it was also like $6,000 for economy. So <laughs> that's not the way to go. Um, that doesn't sound like the way to go. I mean, my guess yeah. is you won't find a direct flight from Chicago, but right. uh, you think I think no matter what, it may be in the 30 hour ballpark because, and, and this is kind of what it was like when I went to Kazakhstan. It's just like that part of the world from this part of the world, uh, you know, there's plenty of flights from here to, to, to Europe and there's plenty of flights from Europe to the Middle East, but it's like, you know, just the further you get, um, inland, it just takes more uh, connecting flights. So I, I think it took me like 36 hours to get to Central Asia, to get to Kazakhstan. Um, and so it, it'll probably be the same thing to, to Zimbabwe. We'll see. And, and if anyone has any travel advice on best hubs to get there, let me know. I'd, I'd love to know. But uh, I, I was starting to see that I think maybe like Emirates Airlines might be the one to go with. They, I've heard good things about I hear about that's their, a very nice airline to, to fly. Yeah, so like they're consistently ranked one of the best in the world in terms of like the experience, I think. They are, and my assumption is that they are heavily subsidized by the United Arab Emirates government, which is a kingdom Mm. or, well, it's an emirate. (laughs) 
are like em- it's emirates <laughs> i don't know what that means yeah. um geopolitics but I mean, it's, with griffin yeah. and nick but uh you know some some societies like that uh the, the government provides a lot of money to uh to support uh, their airlines and so maybe you're not actually having to pay a huge ticket price to get uh, a decent quality flight i i haven't flown emirates though i'm a little surprised you haven't to be honest just because you've traveled so much but yeah and i'm so loyal to delta just because i have all the all the points and like so and they have their partner airlines like uh, air france and stuff and um, so if you haven't seen it griffin has an old video of him getting picked <laughs> up in a porsche from one yeah. airplane and they drive him to his next airplane like on the tarmac uh, yeah <laughs> he had like crazy super secret status i think is what they call that right yeah, it was something called Delta 360, and it was not even status that you could earn into. Well, you 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 earned it, but it wasn't like a listed. It wasn't published. It wasn't. Uh, yeah, it wasn't like they, you need to do this. Down. You need to fly this much. It was just like an invite only uh, status that I have to think it was like somehow some combination of like me being an influencer. Maybe they liked my. The size of my YouTube audience. I don't know. Uh, maybe they liked that I was a journalist. Maybe they liked that I was young and new to the company. I had just moved to New York and like suddenly was doing a lot of travel out of Delta for the first time. And so maybe all of those things combined, they were like, let's hold on to this influencer <laughs> guy. And um, I assume you don't have super secret status anymore, right? Because you haven't no. been traveling nearly as much. Yeah, I haven't been. Uh, but traveling. look, it worked. You're still trying to fly Delta all the way to Zimbabwe, even though it doesn't make any sense. So no, it would it would still make sense. I don't have like the super secret status anymore, but I have um, I am platinum level, which is uh, one below diamond. So diamond's like the highest uh, you can achieve through the published <laughs> criteria, and then platinum well, is one below that. I have a list on Southwest, so I'm kind of a big deal myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Southwest is great. I used to fly Southwest exclusively when I lived in Illinois the first time. Uh, and then it was only because I moved to New York and Southwest had like the terrible terminal uh, B out of LaGuardia. The flight experience just wasn't as good out of New York as it was in Chicago. So then I started flying Delta because their terminal is just really nice in, in New York. And now they've hooked me. Indeed. So anyway, I'm excited to like... Well, get back to, I mean, in our last episode, we were talking about like, now I have the bandwidth having left my job at the recount. I now have the bandwidth to do more client projects and more YouTube projects. And I would love to, to travel internationally and, and teach some classes again. This, this has always been re- very rewarding for me and I get a lot of positive feedback. And then it also gives me something to talk about on the podcast. That's fun. So we'll have to record an episode while I'm there. Absolutely. Maybe a couple. So it sounds like you're you're approving this travel. I should say yes to this. I've decided, uh, after careful consideration and weighing the pros and cons, <laughs> that you have my approval to consider pursuing this opportunity. Yeah. And this will be exciting because well, I have not actually been to this continent before. I haven't been to Africa. Are there any other continents you haven't been to? I also haven't been to South America or Antarctica. But you've been to Australia? Yeah, yeah. When did you go to Australia? That was for Panasonic. It was like a one-off Panasonic trip where Panasonic Australia wanted me to come do some trade shows there. And that was a really rewarding trip. I really enjoyed Sydney. And then I also flew to the other side of the continent. Now I'm blanking on the name of the city. you should uh, like chart it out on Google Maps or something. Like drop yeah. pins everywhere you've been. Be well, I fun. use um I use that app. Um, I mean, no one uses it anymore, but it used to be called Foursquare, and then they kind of spun it off into <laughs> Foursquare is now like the review app, and then Swarm is the uh, check in app, which I don't know if anyone uses anymore. It's been around since like 2010 or something. Um, but it just I love having the data of like where I've been, so I, I keep track of my check ins there. Nice. Nice. And then I just keep like a Google list of all the countries I've been to and when I was last there, which is handy. I reference I it not, often. I am not nearly as well traveled as you. So 
Well, it's funny. It all it. happened like, like a, it all started happening like because of Panasonic in like 2016. Like if I look at this list, it's 80 percent of the places I've been all happened in the span of like two years um, between 26 at the end of 2016 and and then like pretty much to like 2018. Uh, before that, I'd only been a few places. Like I went to Thailand for, to make uh, sriracha. Well, we, uh, you had some sad news happen recently. I'm not sure if that's something you want to talk about here or. Yeah, I, di I didn't want it to be the very first thing we talked about on the episode today, but, uh, but uh, yeah, actually pretty devastating news. And if you follow me on, um, on Instagram, you, you probably saw this, um, but we, we lost my mom. It, I mean, Nick already knows this. Um, my, my, my mom died, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was unexpected, and but um, happily, it it looks like it was peaceful, and and uh, she was having a good week. <laughs> my uh, my wife and Peter saw her at the farmers market the the day she died, um, like that morning, and then she called me that afternoon, and we were making plans about dinner the next night. Um, and as far as I can tell, she was probably gone just a few hours after that. Heartbreaking. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I can speak for your audience. I know there's been kind of a good outpouring of support for you on social media. So I I wish I had more <laughs> helpful things to say beyond. It's just horrible. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I mean, I've had time to process it and, uh, and we have a pretty good support system. I mean, I have lots of great friends like Nick. I called you the, you know, the next morning. Um, yeah. I, the, the thing that scared me and you know, this is not a parenting podcast, but like, you know, I, my, I lost my mom too young. She was only 67, but I'm an adult and I know that this kind of thing is inevitable. So it's like always in the back of my mind that I would have to, to deal with this one day. Uh, I wasn't really prepared though, for the idea that I would have to like parent. I didn't think about that part. I didn't think about how I'd have to talk to my son about losing his grandmother. Yeah. Um, at this age, it's a weird age too, because you know he's smart enough that he has a lot of questions, uh, and he wants to understand it logically, which is hard to do. But it turns out I, it's it, it's gone better than I thought. He, uh, we've been honest with him, and I guess that's like the pediatric guidelines is just like be truthful as much as you can, and you know there's no using euphemisms like passed away and gone to a better place and stuff like that because that's confusing. For a kid so we've yeah we've been clear that she died and she's we're not going to see her again and that makes us very sad um but we'll you know we'll support each other and if you see me crying then you can come and give me a hug and he's done that <laughs> <laughs> and he's three kind of almost four basically he's getting to be four yeah i mean one yeah, tough age one kind of blessing of, of like talking through this with him it, for one, it's been very therapeutic for me to talk through it with him. It hasn't been the scary thing I thought it would be. And two, he's yeah. known all his life about Gene Hammond, my dad who died 16 years ago. And, but he doesn't, you know, he didn't understand the circumstances of why he doesn't know him, uh, or why he's not sure. around. And so finally this week I explained to him that that's, that's why he's gone, that he also died before he was born. And so I think Peter's starting to understand that. And it was sweet because the other day he said, well, I was explaining like a memorial and, and what we're going to do for my mom. And he said, do we need to have a, a memorial for Gene Hammond? And I said, oh, yeah, we we did. We, we did that before you were born. And then later the next day he said, yeah, he said, uh, um, he said, I, w I wish Gene Hammond was around when I was born. And I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> I, and I just like You're instantly cry. started crying. Yeah. And he, he hugged me right away. And so I, I thought that was productive. Like he's not, Sweet he doesn't, kid. he doesn't seem like he's traumatized by this. I think it's clarifying for him and he's, you know, it's yeah. good to have him as part of this process with us. Oh. I, uh, I will say that 
a lot of the comments I've gotten on Instagram from our audience are related to re remembering the times that people have seen or heard us talk about my mom on the podcast or she was on the podcast uh, once. We had her... Uh, was she? I don't remember that. When was that? We did an episode from the campus of Illinois State University. You called in, as usual, and then I did like a semi-live production. And my mom was there because yes. she lived in Bloomington at the time. Um, and so we actually like interviewed her on the podcast uh, about... <laughs> I remember the episode. I'll have to go back and watch that one. Now, now you remember me back from what, like eighth grade, me running around your house and us tearing yes. it up and making videos? Yes. yes. That, was, that, was, that the... was a little bit ago. Yes, and the computer games that you played in our basement. and, and She's referring to our LAN parties. Yes, LAN parties. <laughs> <laughs> we were really cool kids in high school, let me tell you. You were. You were a lovely group. <laughs> and then we also had the episode, people also me have mentioned uh, remembering the episode where we talked about the fire she experienced um, in oh, right. Bloomington. Yeah. Her apartment burned down. And she saved everyone's lives. She got banged, up first, banged on, all banged the doors on everyone's and doors, got, got them all out. Right? Yeah, no one was hurt. Yeah. And then in the years since that, we moved her up to St. Charles uh, 18 months ago. And then so she's lived near us and near Pete for the last year and a half, uh, which has been which has been wonderful. She spent a lot of time with her grandson and I've gotten to see her a lot. So, you know, there's a lot of sadness here, but we also, uh, you know, have a lot of great memories. I have a absolutely drawing of her behind me in the shot right now. <laughs> I'll put I'll put her obituary that I wrote in the show notes so that people can can read more about my mom's life and see how wonderful and inspiring she is. Um, but I, I do just want to like call out one piece that I plugged in there. Um, I mean, I, I wanted this obituary to feel very like positive and, and, and not just like kind of the traditional obituary style. Um, and so, and I also like, I always think as a writer, it's good to have like actual data behind things. Like, can you quantify something like how good someone is? And so, uh, <laughs> I mentioned the story about the, the fire, but also I mentioned that, uh, she had O negative blood, which is the most popular or, or most needed type for transfusions, not the most popular, but the most needed. Yeah. Um, and so she donated a lot. I remember ever since I was born, I think she lost some blood and needed a transfusion uh, after the pregnancy. So she was inspired to give blood a lot. And in the obituary, I wrote that, uh, I mean, I actually found like her, the data in her Red Cross account. And it said that um, since 1990, she's given blood 48 times just to the Red Cross. I know there were other companies like heartland blood and, and other places where she gave but just to the red cross she gave 48 times in the last 32 years That's but a then lives saved right there since i wrote that i found another card <laughs> it was like an older card like pre-internet card where she had my mom was just like me she likes to write down a lot of things keep track of things uh she tracked how many units or how many times she gave before 1990 so i know that it was 30 leading up to 1990 and then another 48 so it's at least 78 times in her life that she donated and probably more yeah and you you knew her as a as a kind woman oh yeah i mean i known her since i was what eighth grade is that when we we all started hanging out yeah in fact She's i should really the credit her lady i should credit my mom with like like a lot of the feedback I've gotten over the years on YouTube, you know, from this audience, from when I do workshops, so much of the feedback I get is like, you're just so kind. You're a very positive person. You're optimistic. You you make it, you know, you make things accessible for us. Um, and I think that's, you know, a hundred percent from her that I yeah. am the way that I am, uh, that I, I try to view things kind of endlessly optimistically like she did. So I guess like to end on an on an on an optimistic note, I am kind of looking forward to her memorial um because, you know, I it's like the saddest thing already happened and then everything after this, I remember this from when my dad died, is just like 
people coming together, telling all these stories. I learn more about him than I ever knew from his, you know, his college friends. And the same is going to happen with my mom. We'll talk about all the beautiful things she did in her life. And then, and uh, I'll, I'll hear things I've never heard before. Um, so it's like, it's yeah. only going to get better. You know, it'll be hard, but all the good stuff is coming. Well, it's a sad circumstance, but I'm looking forward to seeing you. I'm, I'm yeah. going to come out for that, uh, coming up yeah. here soon. So hopefully we get the time to spend a little time together too. That'd be nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be great to see you. Handy Filmmakers is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your filmmaking business. In our last episode, we talked all about monetization options, and Squarespace has a whole bunch of tools for doing that. I mean, not only do I use my Squarespace site to point people to the classes that I've produced, the movie Sriracha that I've made, I'm using it to point people to the platforms where I can make money, but also on the the platform Squarespace has lots of monetization options, including you can upload videos directly, natively to Squarespace. They have membership options that you can do right in Squarespace. And I think even coming soon is paywall VOD for, for video. And then they also have, we talked about in our last episode, Squarespace has this thing called bio sites, where you can do these like little mini websites that I really like. Within that, you can do tipping and other monetization options. So Squarespace has a whole suite of features that make it possible to monetize right within their platform. So check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash griffin and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you, Squarespace. So Nick, I got an Instagram question from Talon. Do you want to read this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> He says he's looking to do a local documentary, 30 Minutes Tops, and he needs to raise some money and wondered what kind of documentary treatment you use. What does it look like? Griffin, what is a documentary treatment <laughs> for those of us who don't know what that means? <laughs> well, it's funny. It's like I'm hoping I know what it means because I realize I, you know, I have an idea, but I, I don't think I've actually well, let me, ever Can I take a stab at it since yeah. you probably know better than I do? A treatment is like a one pager, like here's what I want to make. Like I think mm -hmm. they do it for like Hollywood stuff too, right? Like they, yeah. a treatment is kind of like a, the broad strokes idea before you like actually go write a script or something. Yeah. And I, you know, with Sriracha, I, I made it? it myself, so I didn't, it, that, that's exactly right. Um, and okay. I, I never, I never needed one for Sriracha. I, and then in the work I've done since, I guess, I guess maybe I've occasionally produced some sort of treatment for clients. Um, but it's always kind of depending on the client exactly what they want to do. Um, sure. I've never just needed to go out into the world and just raise money for a project. Um, but I do have a friend who was pitching a lot of documentaries to like back when CNN plus was a thing. They were buying <laughs> for, up for two weeks or whatever. <laughs> yeah. They were buying up projects left and right. And I have a friend who worked for a documentary production company. They would do a lot of historical uh, ar archival sort of documentaries, but also like go out and shoot stuff documentaries. And because CNN was buying all sorts of stuff, he was writing up many treatments. He'd have like, oh, I got 10 ideas. Uh, and so he, he, it's like he'd run like the small ideas past them and, and see which things they're interested in. And then he would go back and actually write a proper treatment. And I do think they were usually between one and two pages. And it was kind of like the research he'd done and why he thinks it's an interesting uh, idea and um, and they greenlit several projects just based on those those short treatments. Of course, then CNN Plus went under, so <laughs> I don't think these projects are happening anymore. Um, well, that's too bad. <laughs> yeah, but so how detailed do you think they get? Like, like are you outlining like who you want to interview and you know kind of putting a bit of the narrative in there, or is it way more broad than that? I mean, I would. I think. I think really. You could call it whatever you want, a, a treatment or a one pager. I mean, the whole goal of it is just to like get someone excited enough that they want to sign off. So it'll depend on the project. But I would always lead with like, what have you already found that is super interesting? What is the side of this right. story that people don't expect and is going to like hook them? So I think if I were writing a treatment for Sriracha, I would say like, the thing you don't know is that this you know, the super popular sauce in the U.S. 
is made by a Vietnamese immigrant who has a fascinating story of how he escaped communist Vietnam after the war and, you know, throw in some details that you found. I think if you could just like paint a little bit of a picture of the the depths of this story that no one's ever realized, uh, that can help sell the idea. I mean, I'll pull up for Sriracha. I did constantly need different marketing pieces uh, for the press. And so I have and, and for film festivals, I had to plug in a lot of the stuff. So I have on my website for at srirachamovie.com, I have a short tagline for the film, a medium log line, a longer synopsis. And then I even have something that does look more like a treatment, which is like a one pager kind of explaining the film. Although this is like almost like a treatment written for a film that is already out. It's kind of, so it includes like the interesting stuff about why you want to watch this film, but then it also includes like how exciting it was that we raised all this money on Kickstarter. And it includes, you know, where you can go buy the film right now. Um, be yeah, like the short tagline is like, it would be like the shortest version of a treatment. It's just the origin story of an iconic hot sauce finally revealed. Um, but then like the longer synopsis is it's been named ingredient of the year by Bon Appetit, best tasting hot sauce according to Cook's Illustrated. And in 2012, Hoi Fung Foods sold 20 million bottles of Sriracha. That's a hundred million pounds of chilies. But even with its cult following, recipes, t-shirts, tattoos, most fans don't know the origin story of this Thai flavor or recognize David Tran, the man responsible for popularizing sriracha in the U.S. Uh, this fast-paced documentary finally reveals the story of sriracha, where it comes from, how it's made, and the people who love it. I mean, I think that's a decent synopsis. It doesn't really get into the the meat of like what makes David Tran super interesting, which I think would be more important sure. if I was trying to like sell this to someone. Um, right. You know, it's like in the synopsis, I'm like, but it's also not trying to give away the film. What you know already, yeah. And... yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I, hopefully that gives you an idea, Talon. I think it, it'll depend on your film, and I think feel free to kind of do whatever you want with, with the treatment. I think focus on like what makes you passionate about the project and why you think an audience would be excited to check it out. And what do you think? Does it need to have a little bit of like why this will be successful too? Like if you're trying to kind of sell it as a project, you know? Yeah, I mean that may be important depending on the the finance or financier that you're you're going after. Um, right. If you want to make it clear that this is going to be a return on investment opportunity, um, but it also it it'll depend on why someone's giving you money. Some people may want to give you money because they are a patron of the arts and they think this important piece of art should exist in their community or it's going to serve some other goal for the community. Um, I think generally if the goal is to like double their money, that's not why people get into films. <laughs> I mean, sure. not indie films, you know, it's like a Marvel film. Hopefully we'll have a nice return on investment, but um, it might be a hard sell convincing someone that like you need to put your money in because you're going to like, do better than the stock market here. Uh, that's hopefully right. not why someone wants a film to to be born because they'll probably be disappointed. There you go. Yeah. We're all set. One more video that I'll, I'll have coming out um, soon. Well, it's funny because like I have kind of a bottleneck already. Like we recorded the last podcast episode and i as the as of the moment that i'm recording this one i haven't even put it out yet because you know we talked about things have happened in my life um but you've been a little preoccupied yeah yeah we, I'm, I'm glad i could t i could take a little break and, and focus on what's important yeah. but i one of the things i shot like a couple weeks ago was i i have a the, the last Iron Man film that I made. Um, but I realized I didn't want to just upload it directly just with no comment. So I decided to record a little intro for it. Um, and, you know, just to give it something fun at the, at the start and at the end. And so I thought rather than just like shooting it in, in this room, I would go out onto the running trail and like actually be running for the video. Did you see this thing that I posted on Instagram? <laughs> I saw it on, what, Instagram or something. I saw your little uh, running tripod set up. Yeah. So I took Peter's stroller, and which he's like, we still use it, um, but, I, you know, it's probably not long. He's starting to get not, too big for. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you're you're an experienced parent. At what age will I stop using the stroller? I mean, you're probably already at the point where you're not using it nearly as often, but there's going right. to be those days where, you know, you're going to the zoo or something, and it's just all day walking, and you'll probably still use that for another year, maybe? Yeah. Be my yeah, guess. I mean, he's still not a fast walker, so it's nice to bring that around. To right. It. And sometimes we even commute to school with it, uh, you know, to preschool. Yeah. But uh, one day when he was not, you know, he was, he was doing something else uh, with Amy out in the world, I took apart his stroller i took his seat out and then i placed my tripod on it and i was kind of like is this even possible and realized i could kind of like bungee down the tripod legs i even used some clamps <laughs> i think i used some tape in one place i just like tried to get it get it real tight onto the stroller and i took the stroller running down the path with my camera right on the on the on the tripod which I think it'll probably probably need some warp stabilizer, but it actually looks pretty smooth and nice. You don't have one of the new iPhones, do you? I have a 12. Oh, so no, not even close. <laughs> what are they, 14 now? <laughs> they so the, the 14 has um, like action mode, which is like crazy stabilized mode, like, yeah. like a GoPro or something. It works pretty good from my brief testing. So I was just thinking is that it, might be kind of cool to throw on. Is it like that. AI stabilization or is it actually some mechanical stabilization? Well, I don't think it's AI, but it's digital. Yeah, it's right. It's, so yeah. the the new but like I guess I'm wondering like what makes way higher megapixel count, so they can they've got okay. a lot of like crop room to work with. If that they just makes have sense. more data than before, which is what makes it yeah. more effective. Yeah. Yep, <clears throat> and then it's got all the gyroscopes and everything in it too, so it can it can do it pretty well, I think. Yeah, I mean it. It's like I made this shoot way too complicated because like you know, <laughs> I, I probably could have just like run it's past a fun. tripod. <laughs> I probably could have just like run towards a tripod and then stopped and like done my little stand up instead of like having to be moving the whole time. But or get this, you could have a camera person with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> with a gimbal. Um, <laughs> and of course as people suggest in the comments like why not also put the gimbal on top of the tripod but then it would have just been too much equipment. I was worried it would already, I was already worried it was going to like fall over. Um, <laughs> fall over and break everything. That's but it's funny. like not only did well, I we look build forward the, to seeing that. Yeah. Well, I had to build this whole contraption, and then also I I put two microphones on the camera. One of them had a dead cat on, and one of them had a you know just its regular windscreen. But it ended up being so windy outside. I picked the worst day to go out and try this. It was like you know it was like <laughs> twenty five mile an hour gusts, and I was going into the woods, so I was thinking like, well, maybe the trees will block it a little bit. Um, it was also beautiful, uh, so I was glad to like go out into the woods because this time of year, but. Uh, but yeah, the, the audio is a little rough, which kind of limits which takes I can use. But I was able to run some of it through a plugin I downloaded. I, I think I need to pay for the plugin because right now it, it sounds like it works, but it um, it's adding like a audio watermark right now. It's like a little beep, beep. <laughs> and so, because um, oh. <laughs> like, I think I told you that I was using that isotope product um what is it called? Yeah. The RX-10 or RX... Which, which version are they up to now? RX-9? RX-10. RX-10 is the latest one. And I okay. used it. It has a great audio... It has a great um, wind reducer uh, function in it. But it also costs like $1,000 for the software, I think. Or it's maybe it's maybe it's 800 I think it's 800 And uh, I was tempted to buy it. They have it. a bunch of different versions, so... Yeah, I was, t I was tempted to buy it. I was kind of shopping. I was checking it out because for a moment, I wasn't sure if I was going to do Adobe Creative Cloud anymore. And uh, so I, I was wondering if I was going to lose Audition and like maybe I should use RX10 instead. But um, I ended up getting my Creative Cloud uh, subscription. So I still have Audition. So I didn't feel like I should buy a whole other piece of audio software. But then this other thing I was trying out in Final Doesn't Cut. Doesn't this plug into Audition though? Yeah, but, but I don't want to pay eight hundred dollars to have a plug-in for Audition. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, the standard is only three ninety nine, but maybe that doesn't have what you need. Can't quite figure yeah. out what's in what version. So I just tried. I tried a plugin that I downloaded called Crumple Pop Wind Remover AI two, and um, ah, it yes. se it seemed to work well. And I think the plugin costs like ninety dollars. So if if it does the job well here, I might I might purchase that so that I can use this. 
slightly cleaner audio. Well, that's fun. So is, is the footage good enough or do I need to help you reshoot this when I'm in town? I think it's good enough. It's one of those things where it's shaky and we'll see what um, warp stabilizer does. But like any time you stabilize something like, you know, on a dolly, even though I'm like running down a hill and it's like, uh, the fact that it's stable at all is a very impressive effect. Uh, so it definitely works. The, the footage is fine. I could probably clean it up a little bit, but even if I didn't put the warp stabilizer on, it's like smooth enough that it looks impressive, I think. Um, and I think the audio is good enough. We'll see. Um, but hopefully I'll get that. So so I guess by the time you're watching this episode, hopefully I've, I've put out a bunch of videos. Uh, you got you got the last nice. podcast. Maybe this maybe this Iron Man video. This is uh, so have you not shared the Iron Man video publicly yet? Because I know I've seen it, but it's just not out. Right. Not out yeah. The I world just, yet. You're gonna I just put it on Vimeo for for Matt. Um, but I think I just realized like it's weird to just put it out with no comment because it's like i'm sure some people would be interested in it but i I wanted to give some context about like my involvement in it and why you might be interested in watching it Uh, sure i think we um we did a an episode talking about how we shot that i think right yeah 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 because it's actually the video that i shot in september 2021 we probably did a i think we did two different podcast episodes about it that fall uh, we talked about it right away and then it took me a whole year of being super busy at work and then finally leaving my job and having some time to edit it. I finally edited it like last month and then gave it to my friends right before the following year's Iron Man. So I got, I got it to them before the next one. Uh, but I just, I still haven't put it out. <laughs> 12 month turnaround it. time. Yeah. Not, not bad for a free video. Free, free video. Yeah. Um, yeah exactly and a, and a waste if i don't share it with our audience like it's just it's just great content that uh, i need to put out for you all absolutely it looks great yeah thanks to me mostly yeah i'm trying to think i am in the you, video am i not you are you jumped in at one point and you also shot See? the key iphone shot uh at the finish line it's like i couldn't be at the finish line because i do this thing where i run alongside the finish line and you stationed yourself right um right at the finish line i said iphone but actually didn't you shoot that on your sony i think i shot it either on the my sony or on one of your other cameras i guess it was yeah. probably my sony i can't remember to be honest yeah but yeah i got i got a critical shot so yeah mostly mostly <laughs> i get the credit i think <laughs> all right my friend it was good talking to you good talking to you I'll see you guys later bye 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 well let's i don't know how to transition <laughs> <laughs> this is the fun transition we'll just do it we'll just do a hard break yeah uh, all right, ready? Yeah. <clears throat>